Software and Security Engineering Lecture 5, third segment. So here we have the public key Needham Schroeder protocol, and this operates at a slightly higher level of abstraction um, than the uh, protocol, the Diffie Hellman protocol, and its um, ancient world equivalent that we discussed before. And um, here we have um, Alice sending encrypted material to Bob, Bob sending encrypted material to Alice, and Alice replying. And is this okay? Well, um, I'm afraid not. You should have guessed that from the fact that it was a question. But how many of you managed to find the actual attack? Here it is. Curiously enough, it took people 18 years to notice this attack after the Needham Schroeder protocol was first uh, published. And that's one of the reasons that when designing um, cryptographic protocols, people tend to be fairly keen on proofs of correctness, because it is so easy to overlook something rather subtle. Here's the problem. And Charlie says to Alice, hi, I'd like to speak to you. So Alice sends to Charlie, Alice's nonce NA and Alice's name encrypted under Charlie's public key. Charlie can decrypt this because he knows Charlie's private key. So he takes NA and A and encrypts them under Bob's public key KB and sends them on to Bob, pretending to be Alice. Uh, Bob decrypts NANA, he finds Alice's name, and so he believes, mistakenly as it turns out, that they came from Alice. So he forms NA followed by NB and encrypts them under Alice's public key and sends them back to Alice as he thinks, but actually to Charlie, because Charlie, like Cecil's courier, controls the network. Charlie can't do anything uh, with something encrypted under Alice's public key, so what does he do? He hands it on to Alice. Alice sees NA and NB encrypted under KA, and she says, Aha! This is Charlie responding to the protocol that I sent him earlier. She doesn't know the difference between NB and NC because these are just random numbers, and um, Charlie's name, Bob's name, isn't actually um, in the uh, protocol under this design. So Alice um, uh, takes NB and encrypts it under Charlie's public key KC and sends it to Charlie. Charlie, of course, can get this, and he can also encrypt it under NB, uh, KB and send it on to Bob. So at the end of this protocol, Alice is communicating with Charlie, and um, that is in fact true. She knows that she's communicating with Charlie. However, Bob thinks that he's communicating with Alice, and he's mistaken, because actually he's uh, communicating with Charlie. And this kind of asymmetry in a man-in-the-middle attack can make it kind of subtle and difficult to spot. But once you've seen the bug, um, of course, you can fix it. And there's a number of ways you can do that. You could put digital signatures and all the stuff inside the packets. Or uh, more simply, you could just put in explicitness. You could put all names in all messages. So um, the first message could be NA, comma, A, comma, C, encrypted under KC. Um, and um, then the message from um, uh, Bob to Charlie could be NA, comma, NB, uh, comma, C. Um, encrypted under KA, and then when Alice got that, she'd realize, hey, there's something going wrong here. I'm not uh, Charlie, I'm Alice. But once you've seen the bug, you can fix it. So, um, takeaway message, try and prove public key protocols correct um, if you can. And um, there is now a tradition of over 20 years, in fact, about 30 years, of people trying to use formal methods to prove protocols correct. Now, one of the ways that you can deal with middle person attacks is to certify everybody's public key. And there are various ways of doing this. One is to do it manually, um, that you physically install a public key um, on the machines which are going to use it. And this is what you do with some implementations of IPsec and when we use uh, Secure Shell SSH at the lab. A second is trust on first use, where you set up keys and then verify manually that you're speaking to the right principle. This is what happens with Signal, with Bluetooth, um, uh, most variants. Um, this is what happens with some uh, systems in vehicles. It's also, also what happens with Home Plug AV, which is used in your wireless LAN extender, and various other systems like that, that they're vulnerable when uh, first used. Um, but unless the NSA gray van is right there at that time, um, you then uh, build on trust um, with principles with whom you're used to communicate. And when you think about it, this is how human trust um, originates. You don't remember the first time you decided to trust your mother. Uh, that goes back into 
the um, you know your very early childhood and babyhood before you could actually form long-term memories. However, a very widespread way of um, certifying public key is to have an explicit certificate. And what happens here is that if Sam is being um, once more our a trusted intermediary, Sam signs Alice as public key and or her signature verification key. And we, we might write down a certificate formally as a signature by Sam on Sam's timestamp, um, uh, a length of time for which the certificate is valid L, which nowadays tends to be a year or less, Alice's name, Alice's public key, and some extra uh, validation or verification data about Alice or um, some information about what the um, certificate is actually valid for. And this is the basis of SSL TLS, the protocol that is widely used um, for clients to authenticate to servers online. So when you um, go online to a website and you see the, the padlock in the uh, browser toolbar, this is signifying that your session is encrypted with TLS. The reason that we have two um, acronyms for it is that it was called SSL initially um, in the um, mid-1990s when Netscape uh, produced it, and then when it became a standard was, and was adopted by everybody else, um, its name uh, became officially TLS, but both names are actually used. And it's used more than just in um, securing web sessions. If you're, you're using um, Skype or Zoom, for example, um, you'll find that TLS is um, being used to encrypt the leg of the communication from your client um, to the server in the cloud that's acting as a relay for the, for the video conference. So here's how it works. Um, the customer, or perhaps that should be the client, C calls the server S, and the client says to the server, I'm client C, here is my serial number C hash, uh, and here is my nonce NC, a random number. The server similarly says, hi, I'm server S, which in most TLS implementations refers to a domain name. Um, then here's S hash, my serial number, NS, uh, my um, random nonce, and CS, um, the certificate and my public key. And then the client sends to the server, K0, a pre-master secret, as it's called, encrypted under S's public key. And then C and S perform a mutual handshake the computer cryptographic hash function of K0, NC, and NS. Uh, and um, this is done differently in the two directions so that you can't confuse them. And if you want to look at the details of this, you can look at the book or you can wait until the part two course in cryptography from Dr. Kuhn in a couple of years' time. Now, this protocol has actually been proved to be secure. Uh, Professor Paulson in 1999 used the theorem prover Isabel to show that this abstract version of the protocol uh, has the security properties that you would expect. And um, this um, uh, re re resulted in an awful lot of work being done on theorem provers in the context of security protocols. And in fact, it was one of the things for which uh, Larry was cited when he was elected to the Royal Society a few years ago. So here's my question, what could possibly go wrong? Um, if a protocol is secure, then surely you can rely on it, can't you?